Ever wondered about the Soviet Union's secret weapon in the space race? The MiG-105 hypersonic Soviet space interceptor is a massive product of Cold War engineering and innovation made by the Soviet's Air Force. In the 1960s, this spacecraft was developed as a response to Dinosaur, a US Air Force program. In this video, we'll be looking at the features of this cool space interceptor and the series of events that were associated with it. Stay tuned. Back in the Cold War days, the US and the Soviet Union were locked in this intense rivalry. They were all about outdoing each other, especially when it came to new technology in aviation. They were pushing the limits of what was possible, coming up with all sorts of wild ideas. Some of them worked out great, but others didn't make it out because of tech issues or running out of cash. The Soviets, especially, weren't afraid to think big. They had some seriously impressive designs, like the MiG-105. Calling it just an aircraft feels off in a way. It was more like they were aiming for something with a spaceship feeling. In the middle of the 1960s, the Soviet Ministry of Aviation Industry and the MiG Design Bureau teamed up to work on something seriously cool, the MiG-105. It is also called the Spiral. Their goal was to create a spacecraft that could do some serious recon and military stuff, both in suborbital and orbital missions. Oh my God. So why the fuss about the MiG-105? What kept everyone talking about it? The MiG-105 stood out because of its design. Forget about wings or rockets like your usual spacecraft. This spaceship was a lifting body type. Basically, it didn't need wings because its fuselage symmetry did all the lifting magic during re-entry into the atmosphere. That meant it could maneuver like a pro during its descent. Back in the early 1960s, the people at Mikoyan were cooking up something innovative the Spiral Combo Aerospace System. Their big dream was to whip up a reusable space ride by the MiG-1970S. For this Spiral project to succeed, it required three components which included an OS, short for Orbital Space Plane, an RB expendable two-stage rocket, and a GSR hypersonic air-breathing launch aircraft. The main deal was the GSR, which was powered by four ramjet engines and had around 16,000 kilograms of fuel. They had plans for two versions of this beauty. Some breaking news uh, from uh, Russia now, well, from space, really. The first one would consume kerosene and hit speeds of up to Mach 4, cruising at around 22 to 24 kilometers up. Once it dropped off its payload, it would head back home. The second version was the Speed Demon, fueled by liquid hydrogen and expected to zoom up to Mach 6, chilling at altitudes of 28 to 30 kilometers. The GSR had a sleek, arrow-shaped look, with vertical stabilizers on the wingtips, engines under the fuselage, and this cool station on top of the wing, where they'd attach and remove the RB and OS. The RB rocket would then launch the OS space plane with the cosmonauts on board right into orbit. Just like the GSR, the RB had options. Either kerosene or liquid hydrogen could power it. Now, onto the OS vehicle. It took some clues from an earlier space plane called the Cybin PKA. It had this flat-bottomed, lifting body design with a triangular shape and a big nose that pointed up. The nose wasn't just for looks, it was specifically designed to help cool down the spacecraft during re-entry. This is a feature that NASA actually borrowed later on in the 1980s for its HL-20 personnel launch system, even though that project didn't work out. Because of the distinctive nose, the OS got a nickname Laypot or Wooden Shoe. What features in the OS made it so interesting? All right, so let's break down what the OS had. It had cool wings that could do shapeshift. Shift the spacecraft into what's called a pre-landing orbit. When the spacecraft hit subsonic speeds, these wings would automatically tilt to a 60-degree angle using electric gizmos. This move wasn't just for show, it pumped up the lift, helping the OS glide smoothly. They had dual roles. During launch and while cruising in space, they would act as wings, keeping things steady. However, when it was time to come back down to Earth, they would switch gears and work as vertical stabilizers, helping the OS keep firm during re-entry. To keep things steady in the air, the main body had a sweep back angle of 78 degrees, while the wings had a 55 degree angle. The big old vertical stabilizer clocks in at 60 degrees. Flying this aircraft wasn't just a walk in the park. Pilots had a whole array of controls to handle, including a vertical rudder, wing elevens, and an air brake attached to the top at the back of the fuselage. Fast forward to 1976, when it made its first subsonic free flight test. Let's talk about it. 
It all started off on October 11th, 1976, when this space plane rumbled down an old airstrip just outside Moscow. It soared through the skies and gracefully touched down at the Zhukovsky Flight Center. Over the next couple of years, the MiG-105 went through its paces. It had a total of eight test flights scattered between 1976 and 1978. They brought up three of these spacecraft, dubbed 105, 11, 105, 12, and 105, 13. But they made them consecutively smaller so they could ride on a Soyuz launch vehicle for some initial testing. Has successfully landed a spacecraft on the moon. Now, here's where things get interesting. At first, people toyed with the idea of towing the OS prototype into orbit. After some brainstorming, they decided to go with the more traditional approach, putting it on top of the Soyuz rocket. But wait, for testing how these crafts handled re-entry, they got creative. They threw these OS prototypes mid-air from a 295 bomber, either cruising at subsonic speeds or moving between Mach 6 and Mach 8. Before they even dreamt of sending these spacecraft into space, they gave them a thorough checkup in wind tunnels to see how they handled them. Later on, they played around with smaller models, known as BOR, stands for Unmanned Orbital Rocket Plane, to investigate their hypersonic aerodynamics and heat resistance. Moving forward, money issues and a lack of interest from the top people in the Soviet hierarchy put a serious stop to things. By July 1970, even the top cosmonaut, German Titov, had left. Things went from bad to worse with the passing of MiG co-founder Artyom Mikoyan later that year. Despite all these setbacks, the program soldiered on for another three years before finally ending in December 1973 when the cosmonaut crew was disbanded. Even though the project hit a bump in the road, it wasn't totally scrapped. They gave it a makeover and called it EPOS short for Experimental Piloted Orbital Aircraft. Instead of dealing with testing a complex orbital launch system, they decided to take the simpler route with EPOS. EPOS was all about testing out some analog systems built into one of the subsonic OS prototypes, the 105-11 from February 1976. They switched up the name back to MiG-105, and on October 11, 1976, this revamped craft took its first spin from a Moscow runway. Smooth sailing, no drama, flying at about 560 meters up before gracefully touching down at the Zhukovsky Flight Test Center about 19 kilometers away. Something big happened that involved a lot of action in 1977 in November. What could it be? In its last flight in September 1978, the MiG-105 flew alongside a MiG-23. As the sun was setting and visibility was getting cloudy, the flight control officer, Major General Vadim Petrov, had a bit of a mix-up. He mistook Uryadov's MiG-105 for the MiG-23, so he told Uryadov to bring it in for a landing. Uryadov realized at the last minute that he's drifting off to the right of the runway, different from where he's supposed to be. He thought quickly and made a sharp left turn to correct the course. Thanks to his lightning-fast reaction, the MiG-105 manages to reach the edge of the strip, but it's a rough touchdown. It caused just a bit of damage and was really a close call. Test pilot V. Uryadov had quite the story to tell after making a lucky escape. The poor craft was written off, but at least it found a new home at the Menino Air Force Museum in Russia. You can still go there to see it today. While they were giving the OS-105, 11 a makeover into the MiG-105, they were also trying something with these smaller OS models, BR. They had a moment in the spotlight during wind tunnel tests. The MiG-105 project was terminated for an unexpected reason. They decided to shift their focus to something called the Buran program. It was supposed to be the Soviet version of the space shuttle, but things didn't quite go as planned. The BOR was used in making heat shield materials for the Buran space plane, the one that was supposed to go head-to-head -head with the American Space Shuttle program for a big part of the 20th century. The Buran project was a roller coaster ride. Back in the 1970s, they had a few false starts with the design, but in the 1980s, the Soviets gave it another shot. They started building two more Buran spacecraft, but they never quite finished them. They even began work on two others, but those never got past the blueprint stage. And then, almost immediately, the whole program stopped after the USSR dropped out of it. 
Buran only managed one uncrewed flight before the whole project got scrapped in 1993 due to money troubles and the USSR leaving. In May 2002, the Soviets made a tragic headlines. What happened? Buran, also known as the OK-1K-1, OK ended up sitting in a hangar at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The roof caved in and destroyed it. Unfortunately, eight persons lost their lives. Even though the MiG-105 never made it to space, it still got a place in history alongside its rival, the X-20 Dinosaur. These two were like a glimpse into what could have gone down if the Cold War had spilt over into space. Now, when it comes to comparing them to Buran, which is the Soviet's answer to the American space shuttles, things get interesting. Buran is often seen as the superior one in the space shuttle ranking, but we'll never know for sure how things would have played out if there had been an actual space showdown or if the MiG-105 had gotten in on the action. Then, in June 1992, Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin, Russia's first democratically elected president, brought some souvenirs to the Smithsonian Institution during a summit in Washington, D.C. with President George H.W. Bush. These models were of the Soviet Buran spacecraft and the Energia launch vehicle, and they marked some big milestones, like the first launches of the Energia in May 1987 and the Buran shuttle in November 1988. What are your comments about the Soviet's MiG-105 hypersonic space interceptor? Share it with us in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Remember to share and subscribe. Thank you.